Today's lecture, Dispatches from the Red Zone uh, with Diana Douglas, who is a national desk producer at National Public Radio and has reported from across the nation and around the world. Douglas twice served as NPR's bureau chief in Baghdad, covering the American occupation and its effects on Iraq. She shared in the Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Award that NPR won for its coverage of the war in Iraq for its award-winning news magazines, Morning Edition and All Things Considered, long format investigations and breaking news stories on everything from hurricanes to immigration and elections to social justice. In 2005, she spent a month in New Orleans covering the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina and has recent, uh, returned frequently to the Gulf Coast in the years since to document the recovery. Douglas has interviewed dozens of soldiers and Marines injured in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq for a year-long series on the medical care wounded veterans receive. She visited their homes, interviewed their families, attended their surgeries, and told their stories to NPR's diverse audiences. She produced and directed Morning Edition for five years before moving to the National Desk and previously worked for KUER, the University of Utah, and at CNN International in New York City. Douglas received a BA in print journalism from Brigham Young University in 2002, originally from Atlanta, Georgia, and a former missionary in Rome, Italy. She now lives in Washington, D.C., I should mention uh, this lecture is co-sponsored with the Department of Communications. We're very appreciative uh, to them, uh, in particular Professor Joel Campbell, who helped to arrange uh, today's lecture. Again, today's topic, Dispatches from the Red Zone, National Public Radio's Baghdad Bureau Chief on Covering the Iraq War. Please join me in welcoming Diana Douglas. Thanks, Naomi, and thanks especially to the Department of Communications. It is so great to be back at BYU. Um, I had basically two assignments when I was the bureau chief in Baghdad. I was um, covering the American occupation, and I was covering the occupation's effects on Iraq. And um, I'm just going to basically tell you how we do that, and please feel free to ask any questions that you have. Um, so basically, you start getting to Iraq by flying to Paris and then flying to Jordan and um, flying from Jordan on a commercial flight into Baghdad. And when I did this, I basically spent the night in Jordan and woke up early the next morning and put on a black headscarf and a black shador and it was basically covered head to toe, all black. and. Um, got on a plane and I was the only woman on this plane because everybody else on the plane was a contractor for DynCor or Halliburton or, you know, any of the other contractors that are busy working in Iraq. And um, I learned very soon that I was basically dressed in overkill because the women in Iraq don't necessarily wear all black all the time. So I didn't have to wear that all the time. And um, we, we landed at Baghdad International Airport. You fly in Basically, you fly in on a, on a commercial jet and you're looking down 10,000 feet until you're right directly above the runway. And they say, okay, here we go. The pilot gets on the, uh, the announcer and says, here we go. And you basically turn the nose of the plane down and start spiraling in to the city because there's so much artillery and so many rocket-propelled grenades like the insurgency has that they will shoot down planes and they have so we had to spiral down and um, that was a little bit terrifying <laughs> anyway so you land in Baghdad I mean, basically anybody here could be in Baghdad the day after tomorrow if you wanted to um, the US Army comes in of course through Kuwait but we just take normal flights and um, anyway so I basically landed in Baghdad and had a drive down the most dangerous road in the world which is the road from the airport into the city and um, I was picked up by two armored cars. NPR owns two armored cars. And um, they used to belong to the King of Jordan or something. And um, they are like basically blast proof and bulletproof. And um, they take them in two because if one of the cars gets disabled, they want to have a chase car so you can run in the back. So I'm sitting in this car with these people with huge, huge artillery. And um, like they all have automatic weapons. and. Um, you know, they're just like, okay, don't look out the window, don't make eye contact with anybody, just look down, and if something happens, we'll protect you. And I was like, what am I doing? So, um, so anyway, I, um, we just went through the, the, probably the most terrifying ride of my life, and we landed at, finally, 
at NPR's bureau, and NPR has a house in just a bad dead neighborhood, and in the um, in the house there are all the rooms where all the reporters live upstairs. We have two reporters and a producer that live there. And downstairs is where all of the Iraqi staff work. So we have this vast local staff. We have drivers and translators and cooks and, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> and um, yeah, we uh, basically rely on them almost entirely for the job of telling the story of how the war is affecting Iraqis. And to tell the story of how the war, like how we're doing in the war, we have our um, reporters that do embeds. So, um, basically, our neighborhood was, I'm just telling you this in case you're interested. I mean, people always ask me these questions about like where, like how you report. So, um, so we, um, we lived across the street from this operation called Fox News, and they had <laughs> Guantanamo-style security. I am not kidding. They had like 20-foot blast walls all around, and they had security on both ends. So NPR just sort of flew under the radar, and or flew under the radar, and we took advantage of their security. We also borrowed flat jackets and satellite phones, and we ate at their house sometimes. So, really, if you're a big news organization, do not let NPR close by because we are way too poor to pay for ourselves. Um, so anyway. Yeah, so we lived next to Fox News, right across the street, and then down the street in the same neighborhood, but not with the same security company, was CBS, ABC, and CNN. So there was this, um, there was this kind of pod of um, Western news organizations altogether. There are a lot of news organizations in Iraq, and um, NBC, and... Um, the Washington Post and the New York Times all had separate places. So if, in order for us to get to their houses, we would either, well, we would basically have to do our own convoy. So the most dangerous thing that we would encounter on the road was American convoys because they are, um, they're required, I mean, they're ordered to shoot anybody that comes within like 50 feet. So when we would see an American convoy on the road, we would pull way to the side um, and just wait for them to pass because they are a huge target for, you know, roadside bombs, in, in, improvised explosive devices, stuff like that. And then also they will lean out the back and they have a gun trained, ready to shoot anybody. So whenever the American convoys pass, we were really, really scared. Um, so, I mean, I can just, you can just imagine how hard it is to move around the city like this and how hard it is to cover a war like this when it's so dangerous. Um, so we, um, we had five Iraqi translators, and they came from all over. They were Shia and Sunni, and um, we had four drivers, also Shia and Sunni, and we had to have Shia and Sunni so that we could go into the various parts of the city because there were parts of the city that were entirely Shiite, and there were parts of the city that were entirely Sunni, and then there were parts of the city that were mixed. So if we wanted to go to one of these places, like the Ministry of Interior was only in the Shiite area, so we had to get a Shiite driver and we had to take Shiite translators. And if we wanted to go to an area that had Sunni, um, you know, an interview or something like that, we would have to take all the Sunnis. And um, we had to try to avoid having a, a, a small civil war in our own house. So, um, so that was important. Um, so basically my job as the bureau chief was I would um, tell the Iraqi staff what to do and then I would tell our American reporters what to do. And um, our Iraqi staff, I would have one person, I was there in 2006 and in 2007. So um, I know a lot of people have tuned out of the Iraq war, but I'll just remind you of what was happening in 2006. We were doing an operation called Operation Together Forward. This was before the surge and it was probably the darkest days of the Iraq war where the Civil War was really, really intense. And there, there were times that we would get 150 bodies every morning on the banks of the river, um, on the Tigris River, and um, you know, 90 of them would be unidentifiable because they were so tortured. So it was a really, really rough time to be in Iraq. And um, OK, so <laughs> so yeah, so it was, it was a, uh, it was, it was tough. It was tough to go to sleep every night in the city and then wake up every morning in the city and get to work. So um, so we would have one person watching the Saddam Hussein trial because that was still going. We'd have one person watching the Iraqi parliament because that was still going. Um, we would send them out to bombings after they happened if they were really spectacular. It started to be a point in the war where 
the bombings got so big and um, they got to be so gruesome that people started tuning out. Like, Americans were just like, we don't want to hear any more about dead bodies in Iraq. We don't want to hear anything else about soldiers dying in Iraq. We don't want to hear about the war at all. And so it was our job to, um, to not only cover the war, but cover it in a way that was different and unusual. And that got to be a real challenge. <laughs> so I'll tell you a little bit more about how we did that. But I'm just going to um, just keep talking. We would call the morgue every morning. We would call the Ministry of Interior every time we heard a bomb go off, which was all day long. And, um, and if we heard gunfire really close, we would call the Ministry of Interior because we had contacts within these ministries. And, um, and they would tell us what was happening. And if it was, um, if it was a bombing that it seemed like it would be relatively safe for us to send someone to, we would send someone there. But um, I couldn't hardly leave the house at all um, because I was worth a lot of money as an American. So um, I'll tell you just really quick an anecdote. We had a, um, a reporter there named Jamie Tarabay for about two years. And she was interviewing someone, one of the foreign ministers, and he stopped in the middle of the interview and gave her this really weird look. And she was like, what's the matter? And he said, do you know that you are worth $1 million? And she, and she was Australian, so she wasn't even American. And she was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, foreign news correspondents are worth so much money to the insurgency because this was at a time when they were kidnapping and beheading them with alarming regularity. And... Um, and if you didn't, if you got kidnapped, a lot of times, if you kidnap a, someone from the U.S. Army or someone from anyone in the U.S. Uh, military, they won't pay for that person to be released because they don't want to put a price on the head of anyone who works for the U.S. Army. But if you work for a Western news organization, they probably will pay. So n the news reporters are worth the most. I got there right after Jill Carroll was um, kidnapped. So the price was really high. Um, okay, so... Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about the people who worked with us. We had um, basically five translators. The first one was named Abdullah, and we found him at a rally near the very beginning of the war, and he worked for us for about five years. He's now at the Columbia um, University School of Journalism. He got a, you know, some sort of grant to go there. And um, he would... He would just sort of watch the news as it happened and watch the Iraqi news and would translate what was happening and how it was being received, and um, he would report it back to us. And then um, we had someone named Salim who we got from the U.S. Army. He had been, oh, not the U.S. Army, with the U.S. Marines. He was in Fallujah with the Marines, and he was a translator for them. And I think he got... I think he started seeing things that he didn't like seeing, and so he wanted to keep translating, but he, because the money is really good, but um, I think he got sick of seeing some things. So, um, so Salim would go out and he would, um, he would do interviews for us, and they would bring these interviews back, and they would translate them, and then we would use them to, to file our stories. This is, a, I mean, this is how we would cover, basically, Iraq totally relying on our local staff. We had a woman named Isra who worked for us who um, was a very devout Shia, and um, she had, we really needed to have a woman on staff because in a, in a really, in, in a disintegrating Muslim country, you can only get, you can't really get into women, you can only get into men if you're a man. You know what I mean? There's, like, the, the sexes don't really mix that much. So, um, so she did a lot of stories for us on women's prisons and on um, mothers and families. And um, she really, really helped us break in and see how the war was affecting families and women and um, children and stuff. So um, I think she is at Pacifica University now. Almost all of these guys have left Iraq. And we just keep getting more translators because <laughs> they just keep coming in and out. And then um, we had our Sunni was named Kais, and he was gay. Of course, he was in the closet in Iraq, and um, and he got he was under the protection of the committee to protect journalists for a while because he was carjacked and um, he got pistol whipped and he nearly died. So um, we never lost anyone. We never lost any of our translators. They um, they came really close, but we never lost anyone. We had somebody who worked for us who then worked for Reuters, and um, he was killed at an American checkpoint. Um, in 2004, we did a long send-up of it, um, but no one from our bureau has been killed. 
which is pretty amazing. Um, so I'm, I've basically given you an idea of how we covered the Iraqi side of what was happening during the war. And to cover the American side, we would have to send our reporters on embeds because there was so little movement. We really couldn't leave our house, and there was very little movement that we could do in the city. But I'm going to play you a really quick piece of tape from um, one of the – no, 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 this is all wrong. Um, from something that Salim got for us, he was um, – we wanted to do stories that sounded really different from what you had heard a million times, like the sound of a bomb and the sound of people crying. I mean, this was four and five years into the war, and people really didn't want to hear stuff like that anymore. So um, we found we found Salim sent out we sent him out to um, to cover basically how how the, this um, bubbling insurgency and this like sort of simmering civil war was affecting like daily life in Baghdad. And um, he came back with this tape of um, riding along in an ambulance, and we turned it into a story. You'll hear Ann Garrels, who was the reporter that I was with most of the time in Baghdad, and she's telling the story. And while you listen, I just hope you understand there is no way that an American could have gotten this tape. Let's see if I can play this so you can when this ambulance got to Yarmouk Hospital in central Baghdad, the emergency room was already jammed with casualties and awash in blood. Overwhelmed doctors told the medics to take the latest bomb victims to another facility, precious minutes or more away. As they loaded the wounded back into the ambulance, relatives demanded they also ride inside. They refused to get out, even though this meant others whose lives hung in the balance would be left behind. A fight broke out with some of those escorting wounded banging the ambulance with their rifle butts. They got their way. But the overloaded ambulance didn't get very far before it was blocked by a checkpoint and backed up traffic. The relatives grew hysterical. The driver did what he could, but none of the cars would move aside. Please clear the road, he shouted. Have you no morals? Please open the road. I have critical cases. The Rocky soldiers at the checkpoint did nothing to help. When the medic checked the broke out with some of those escorting wounded um, banging the ambulance with Basically, I I can't tell you how hard it would have been for us to tell the story of a disintegrating civilization without our local staff. Um, they basically did all of the reporting and we we relied really, really heavily on them. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, yeah, um, in the back, someone asked how NPR's coverage was different from Reuters and CNN. Um, CNN is – CNN has two stations that they were feeding for. They were feeding for CNN International and feeding, fe feeding for CNN um, local – or, you know, national, basically. And they had a very, very small appetite for news from Iraq. And um, – I have to say, by the time I got there, people were really tuning out of the war. And um, I think that by relying on our local staff, I think that we were able to really get in and tell the stories of what was happening there um, without, without um, putting our own lives in danger. And um, CNN also relied really heavily on their local staff. And um, I mean, all the news organizations did. And um, radio is different in the sense that you have time to really tell stories and really flesh out stories. And, um, and you have to paint a picture with just the sound that you have. I mean, I don't know how panicked um, you can tell Anne's voice is as she's telling this story, but she is. And by the end of the story, the person in the hospital with this panicked family 
and all of these crazy drivers banging the butts of their M16s or, or their um, AK-47s on the um, on this ambulance, begging someone to take them to a hospital. There is so much panic, and by the end of the story, the drivers are so nervous that they're afraid to tell the family that the patient in the back has already died. And um, you just you just you just learn that you can you can paint a picture without in radio without making a really big footprint. I mean, when when CNN goes out or when ABC or when CBS goes out to a scene, they have to take someone who does sound. They have to take a video cameraman, engineers, and reporters. And so it's a huge operation. And then, of course, since they're in Baghdad, they have to take their security and um, private security. And it's so hard for them to get stories that they sometimes just don't. Whereas with us, it's just a microphone and a little, you know, a little recorder. And um, and especially if you're Iraqi and you're interviewing somebody, you can get them to be really honest and like really tell the story of what's happening. Okay, so that's the story of how we we covered Iraq, and um, how we covered the American mission and how the Americans were doing was through all of our contacts in the green zone. So, like I said, we lived outside of the Green Zone. The Green Zone is a huge, huge um, fortified area in the center of the city where Saddam's palaces used to be and where all of his government buildings used to be. And um, the Americans have moved in and set up really, really high walls around it. And um, in order for us to get in, we would have to go through about 15 checkpoints. <laughs> and so we would get dropped off. If we wanted to go to a press conference or something, we would get dropped off at the gate, at the very first gate, and blast walls are all around there, like 25 feet high. And we would start going through checkpoints, and they would send dogs, and they would, you know, like sniff you for bombs and all this stuff. You had to show ID a million times and get fingerprinted and all this stuff. And then when it was finally over, you would get into what was called the CPIC, the Central, you know, Command Press Information Center. And there would be generals in there, or, you know, lieutenant generals. And um, when I was there, the, the briefing, the man briefing us was Lieutenant General William Caldwell, and he would always stick with his talking points. <laughs> and um, okay, and um, and so it was like the the press conferences at the Green Zone were a catastrophe. We would ask these questions, and they would always, always, always stick to their talking points. In fact, I've talked to a general um, since I met him at West Point, and he said it was really hard because he would have to stick with the talking points that the Army sent him, even though sometimes he knew that um, we were asking all the right questions and he just couldn't answer them. So, so going to press conferences was kind of a waste of time, but it was nice to get out of the house every so often. <laughs> um, going to embeds with the U.S. Army was by far the best way to cover the Army and the, military, or the, uh, the Marines. They loved to have reporters embed, and um, they would... They, they loved it, and we loved it because we would get these great accents. We would get really great enthusiasm. Interviewing soldiers and Marines is so wonderful. They, I mean, they, they just are so colorful and so great. And um, the only problem, of course, is, is that if you interview someone who works on a mission for, um, for the military, it's a little bit like interviewing a Mormon missionary. They're always going to say things are going great. I've never seen things going better. And um, so we would have to really temper that with small doses of reality. And they would, they would, they would um, like the, the, the press information officers would say things to us like, why aren't you doing good stories? And we're like, we're just telling the stories that we see. It was really frustrating. Because um, we would just try to tell the stories that we see and, um, and tell them as honestly as possible. And they would say, well, why don't you do a story about this nice lady here who left a kid back home? And we'd be like, well, because we woke up this morning and there were 150 bodies in the morgue. So it would be nice to do a story about this nice lady who left a kid at home, but this isn't really a story about the war. You know what I mean? Um, and it's so fun to go on embeds because the, um, the, the uh, soldiers will always apologize to you if you don't see fire. So <laughs> they're always like, I'm really sorry no one shot at us this time. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Um, and um, it was dangerous because the U.S. military is a really big target, especially in Baghdad, and especially at the time that I was there, they were um, they were really targeted by the insurgency. It was like you know they would come in with really big cars and really big machines and really big weapons, and um, it attracted a lot of attention. So you had to move really quickly from spot to spot if you were with the army because um, you can't stay very long in one spot. And also, you see things through the Army's perspective. Like, we would interview people while we were on embeds, and um, 
you know, you could only talk to the Americans because you see how much they can't understand because you can only go one person. But, like, you can't bring a translator with you. And so, you know, you would watch them try to talk to tribal sheikhs and them try to talk to tribal leaders, and you would see how frustrating it was for them because they couldn't understand because you couldn't understand. No one understood, you know what I mean? And they have translators, but, um, but they're not always with you in the moment. So um, we... Um, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Did you say it was going on any bedroom and they love to have reporters in bedrooms? Yeah, I always felt like people with the army really, really liked to have um, to have coverage. I, I I never like I never really found anyone in the army that was antagonistic toward having a reporter with them. So I know it was <laughs> Well I mean M bed, not in bed. <laughs> no, I like they would be set up by the um, public information officers, and um, embedding with the army, we would do it for usually one to two days at a time, and um, and I mean we did some longer embeds. Like if we were going up to Fallujah or to Mosul or to Kirkuk, we would embed for longer times because it was there was so much transportation involved. But in general, I really felt like um, the Army wanted, and, and the, the military in general, really wanted to have their story told and to talk to reporters. and Because they had a story they wanted to get sent home to. And um, yeah, I felt like everyone was really cooperative when we wanted to embed. They would really go out of their way to make sure that we were able to um, go with them. Yeah. That is a very, the question was, how reliable were the Iraqi government sources? That is a very, very good question. Um, the Iraqi government, especially the time that I was there, was in real disarray. And so any source that you had on the government was um, tainted in some way. And um, the government, like especially the, um, like from the prime minister's office on down, People really had a story they wanted to get out, and so um, they would change the numbers, and they would change, you know, you just have to be really, really careful, and you would have to um, try to um, verify independently as much as possible, which sometimes was impossible. <laughs> but, um, yeah, if we couldn't verify, we couldn't run it. So, yes? I wanted to follow up to that. Uh, using your Iraqi source, and um, you've heard of journalistic um, ob objectivity. How objective were your Iraqi Staff that you used to get the sound for you and so forth. Did you feel they were objective? I, I think that is an excellent question. Um, I think that the Iraqi staff was definitely living through the war, and um, and like I said, you know, we had Shiite and Sunni Iraqi translators and reporters, and they of course had different ideas about what things meant and how things were going. They had different opinions about the Mehdi army and different opinions about how powerful um, the Ayatollah or how powerful the prime minister or how po powerful the president really was and who was really in charge of Iraq. And um, we had to really, really watch it to make sure that there wasn't, like I said, a little mini civil war within our own office. So um, yeah, it was, it was tough. But I mean, if they brought us tape and they translated it for us, we were, we were pretty trusting of them. Um, yeah, I, I would say that we were really trusting of our Iraqi staff. I, more so than I think a lot of the other news organizations. I'll tell you, we found um, our house manager, Varam. We found him, um, Ann Garrels, who you just heard, was stayed through the bombing of Baghdad during in 2003. And the, the day that all the bombs cleared and everything was over and the Saddam Hussein statue fell, this guy walked up to her. He was a um, professor at Baghdad <coughs> University in, in, in electrical engineering, and he said, can I please use your satellite phone? I want to call my family in LA and let them know I'm safe. Lots and lots of people came up to her at that point and were asking to use her satellite phone, and Varum was one of them. And he, of course, Baghdad University stopped you know, needing electrical engineer teachers after a while, and, um, and so he ended up working for us as our house manager. He, um, I'm just going to keep telling you this story just because it's really interesting. He got kidnapped after I left. Kidnapping is so common in Baghdad. And um, so he got kidnapped and was held for a couple of weeks. And his family, he was an Armenian Christian. And the Armenian community came together and the Christian community came together and paid the ransom. And he was released. And he now lives in the Armenian community in Los Angeles. So 
We lost a lot of people that way. And I never felt... Like, I never felt sad when they would leave, and they would, they would like, our, our Iraqi um, translators and staff would escape to Syria or to Jordan or to Turkey. They would emigrate all the time, and we would have to get new ones. And um, I never felt, I never really felt bad, because I always wanted them to leave. It was just always hard, because it put us out a little bit. But I, I tell you that story because Varm had been with NPR since 2003, and a lot of the other people had been with us for that long as well. Um, one of our drivers... <laughs> One of our, our cars was in an accident once. There are all these generators all over Baghdad. It's the only way that it's lit up. And so he was driving home one time in this, you know, 12-ton vehicle. These things weigh so much. And um, he hit, a, he hit a, a grease spot from one of the generators, and he slid into the median of the, um, the highway. And he got arrested, and he was a Shiite. His name was Abu Haider, which is a super, super Shiite name. And um, so he ended up in jail for a night, and we, of course, had to try to get him out. And we, like, you know, me and Annie weren't trying to get him out. We, of course, sent our, our local staff to do it, because if we had shown up, it would have been a catastrophe. So, um, so our local staff shows up and tries to get him out, and seriously, every single hand asked for a bribe, every single person. Like, every magistrate, every judge, every jailkeeper, everyone, 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 and we found one honest soul named Ali who didn't ask for a bribe and um, we decided to interview him because it was so great that we had this one Iraqi policeman who wasn't, who wasn't corrupt, at least in this one instance. And um, we thought it was really telling because at that point in the occupation, the stated goal of the U.S. Um, occupation was to build up the Iraqi army. The idea, you probably remember this, they stand up, we can stand down. So, um, so we wanted to do a story about the Iraqi army, but it's hard to get into these people because, you know, they are, <laughs> they are really, really, really under a lot of pressure because if you collaborate with the Americans, you are in kind of in big trouble. So a lot of times they would show up in, in masks when they would come to missions and stuff. So anyway, so we have this one, this one honest translator, Ali, and, um, I mean, this one honest policeman, and we decide to interview him because we thought he was such a standout. And um, I'll just play you a couple of clips of things that he explained to us about being in the Iraqi police force. Um, you'll hear him in Arabic. We brought him to the NPR bureau and interviewed him there because we didn't want to go to his house. It would have been too dangerous. So we brought him to our bureau and interviewed him there, and he sort of explains what it's like to try to become an Iraqi policeman and what sort of pressures he's under. And um, you'll hear him in Arabic, and then we have a translator on top of it. So that... Oh. You either become a policeman or a soldier, or you sit at home jobless, or you're seduced by criminals or terrorists. Um. I really liked him saying that. I thought it was really. <laughs> I thought it was really illustrative of the of the um, of the dilemma that a lot of the men in Iraq found is that there was no there were no jobs except you could join the Iraqi police. It was a little bit dangerous, or you could sit at home bored, or you could become a terrorist, um, and you know start lobbing missiles into the green zone. And um, he talks about he talked later about how. Everybody who is in the police force, it's the only job that's available. So everyone who's in the police force pays a bribe to get in. And um, he's like, I had to save up tons and tons of money to get the bribe so that I could get in the police force. Then he backtracks and is like, actually, I didn't pay a bribe. But a good guy. But a good guy got me in. As far as I know, I was the only one at the academy who didn't end up paying. The majority of the Iraqi police love to go out on patrols and checkpoints because it's where they can make money from bribes. When there's a particularly big case involving thousands of dollars, our commander assigns it to a corrupt officer, and they split the take 50-50. I like this team a lot, too, because it explains the, uh, the corruption <laughs> It explains the corruption that was so rampant in the police force at that time, and it was something that the Americans talked to us a lot about. They said, you know, you can't make fighting corruption your number one goal in Iraq or else you're going to be really, really frustrated. I talked um, later to a lieutenant colonel named John Noggle um, from the U.S. Army, and he was talking about working with his counterparts in the Iraqi police, and he said it was so frustrating because he never knew who was good and he never knew who was bad because there was no good and there was no bad. And um, 
I'll just play you a little bit of what he explained to me about the Iraqi police. And um, I actually did this after I left Baghdad, but I think you'll find this interesting. I received Okay, I'm going to just set this up a little bit more. So John Noggle was in Fallujah um, during the Fallujah One, which was the first incursion into Fallujah. And, you know, so he was trying to work with his, his, um, his Iraqi counterparts, and he had this guy that he liked a lot, and then, um, and then things turned really fast, and he was faced with this really, really, really tough decision. I received multiple credible reports that Brigadier Ishmael was supporting the insurgents in Fallujah, that he was providing weapons, ammunition, body armor to the insurgents in Fallujah who were then fighting against the Marines and against some of my soldiers. And I was at that point faced with a horrible dilemma. What do I do to this police chief who has clearly risked his life to, to help us Every time I think about it, I wonder if I did the right thing. But ultimately, what I decided to do was nothing. My assessment was that for uh, Ishmael to stay alive, this is the minimum he had to do. This is the minimum tax he had to pay to the insurgents. And, and therefore, I decided to let that happen, and I never confronted him about it. And it is something I would love to talk to him about today, although, sadly, I understand that he's no longer with us. Um. Okay. <laughs> um, telling the story of the Iraqi police is basically telling the story of how successful the U.S. occupation was going at that time. And um, finding someone to tell the story from the American side and someone to tell the story as an Iraqi policeman, so helpful. And, um, and I think it really helped us to, to really flesh out why we were there and what we were trying to do and how successful we were being or weren't being. And um, we, I mean, this guy, Ali, turned out to be this total godsend. I mean, the fact that Abu Haider had to get arrested and spend the night in jail, it was worth it because of Ali and all the tape that we got from him. I'm going to tell you one more thing of him explaining basically the mentality of the police and, um, and how hard it was for the U.S. Army to work with them. Um, let me see. He's talking about how... Um, all the suicide bombs that, and all of the, um, just all the bombs that he sort of saw every day and, um, and how people will pay money to get their friends released and stuff. And here he is talking about insurgent bombs. If some guy kills innocent Iraqis with a roadside bomb, there's nothing the militias can do for him. He will go before the courts. Okay, so if you kill Iraqis... If a bomber targets Americans, there will be pressure on us, and he'll get released. Um, I, just, I, I really liked this story, and I, I feel like we ended the story with him saying this long prayer that he says in Arabic, it's from the Quran, that he says for himself to stay protected. Um, and um, I just really liked to hear the pressures that he was under from the insurgency, from criminals, from militias, from the Americans, and, um, and then from his own conscience. And I, I, really, I really felt like it was, a, it was serendipity that we found him. Um, I actually have five minutes left, so if anybody has any questions, I would love to hear them. Yes, Dan Bomas in the front. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you talked about some of the uh, pressure you had from your PIOs and military units. You know, to tell a story about this, you know, wonderful single mom who left the kids behind or whatever. Uh, and we get a lot of pressure from people saying, why don't you tell the story about all the good things our troops are doing in Iraq? And they nearly always cite, you know, oh, they're building schools, et cetera, et cetera. It's like they have their own set of talking points. But. Uh, during your service in Iraq and afterward, has your loyalty, patriotism, your fundamental integrity been questioned uh, by people who see NPR and uh, news agencies in general as having 
an anti-American agenda? Yeah, all the time. I would say that happens a lot. And um, it's what's your answer to that? It's probably one of the hardest things that you put up with as a reporter, because um, I was risking my life to be there. And I know that the reporters that I was working with, all of the local staff, all of the people that I was working with were also risking their lives to tell the stories of what was happening in Iraq. And um, it was really, really hard to have your patriotism question because I feel like reporting on the US Army and reporting on our mission there, reporting on how things are going is completely patriotic. And I feel like it's sort of the uh, fundamentals of having a free society as a free press. And so it was really, that was really, really frustrating. That was probably one of the hardest things about going there is people saying, why are you telling the good stories? And I'm like, I'm telling the stories. There's no good and bad. I'm just telling the stories. So anybody else? Yes, please. This is a follow-up to Nancy's question. Um, I'm sure there, you know, there's obviously an appetite for people to see progress. But if it's not there, what do you do? So what's the process you go through when you're looking, you know, when you when you have pressure to tell a positive story or find something like that? Or do you just know them when you see them out in the, in the three translators? Um, I felt like we, I kind of take I kind of take um, umbrage at the idea that there are good and bad stories to be well, told. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, progress is what I'm thinking of, like where there's an indication that things maybe are improving. Um, yeah, I think that um, a lot of a lot of it has to do with the public's appetite, and um, I know that like when we when we are reporting from Iraq and we start a news story, car bomb in Baghdad has exploded near this market. It's killed six and injured 13. People, the second you hear a car bomb in Baghdad, people are gone. Like, nobody wants to hear it. They are changing the station and listening to KSL. Do you know what I mean? And um, so we had to really, really, I mean, <laughs> um, and so we had to really, really try to find ways to make the story interesting and to tell new things about the story. Because as the war has dragged on, now, I mean, we're in, we have been in Iraq since 2003, and it's now 2009. Do you know what I mean? This is a really long story, and um, I would say that our biggest challenge wasn't telling good or bad stories, but was just telling new stories and um, keeping people interested in a story that was pretty static at the time that I was there. So um, that was one thing. Yes? How did your preconceived notions of the Iraqi people and of the war in Iraq change? Okay, the question was if I had any preconceived notions about Iraqis and about the war and if they changed while I was there. I um, had, I, I knew a bit about the Muslim world. I um, didn't know a ton, but I knew some. And um, I can't think of any times that my preconceived notions about Iraqis changed, except that I saw them as more human, which is the only, that's the only thing that can happen the more you well, do you know what I mean? Like, I know what a Shiite is, and I know what a Sunni is now, because I know Shiites and I know Sunnis, and I know, you just know more about the country and more about the people. And that's one of the problems that we had with the reporters that were there for long stretches of time. Anne Garrels has been there since 2002. And she knows that story backwards and forwards. And a lot of times you forget how little people in the States know about Iraq. Like, nobody knows where Suleimania is, and nobody knows where. You know what I mean? Like, no one knows where this mosque is as opposed to that mosque, and no one knows who Imam Hussein is and stuff. And so it's, it, you have to explain it like you're talking to a fourth grade class a lot of times. And um, so it was, that was a problem that I had. Like, the more that I got to know the story, the harder it was for me to be, like, to, to explain it in simple terms in, in, like, a way that I would explain it to my mom or my grandparents or something. So not that my grandparents aren't here today. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you all so much. This has been really a pleasure. I really appreciate it.